All right, everybody, this is Ross the Fig Boss. In today's video, we're gonna talk exclusively about the in-ground fig trees here because we've learned quite a bit over the last four to five years of planting these trees in a very unorthodox way where I've been planting pretty much 90, probably at 98% of the trees here on the property that I have planted in the ground are spaced very closely. And that's you know, what you would consider as high density, right? As a lot of people who maybe grow apples or are familiar with apples, traditionally they were spaced much further apart until they got new rootstocks, dwarfing rootstocks, columnar rootstocks, and they were able to plant their apple trees actually very close together. And I wanted to see if there was a way that I could actually plant my fig trees just as close or pretty darn close together. And just to see what would happen, of course, there are other motives and other reasons, like, you know, there's so many varieties out there and I wanted to keep them all, I wanted to trial them all, I wanted to plant them all. We just don't have enough space here on the property. And what I've learned over the years, um, I think I've got, fi finally got it all figured out, at least, with planting them that close. It took me a number of years, and as we you know, did this very unorthodox planting, We've learned so much along the way. It's really uh, eye-opening when you do things improperly, uh, when you do things in the way that they're not meant to be done, uh, when you go against the rules, as they say, um, because you understand, well, why is it that this isn't working or this is working? You get to understand the why rather than just, this is how it is and that's it. So for me, I've, I picked up a number of things and I wanted to hash that out with you guys in this video. Um, we have a tree here. This is my little ruby. It's on the southwest corner of the house. It's been in the ground for, I think, four or five years. Uh, and this is probably its fourth season that it survived the winter. So it's getting to some reasonable size. I mean, it is a dwarfing tree. It doesn't grow very quickly. Uh, it's one of the few tr uh, true dwarfing fig trees that you can grow. And to be honest with you, um, it's done phenomenally. And that's because it survived the winter every year. That's because I have not really pruned it all that much. Uh, that's because I have not chopped the trees back to six to 12 inches like I've done with 90 to 95% of the other trees on this property. Because in order to plant fig trees so close together, you have to deal with the problem of light. And I've learned this a few years ago now that if the, the, the branches here, when they come out of the, the wood as the tree wakes up, these new branches are where the main crop forms, obviously. And if these new branches don't get the light that they need, well, you just don't get the fruit set that you're looking for. Somebody actually commented on one of my videos recently and they asked me, hey Ross, my fig trees aren't fruiting. I've had them for about four years. Uh, and, and I was like, okay, send me some photos. I'll try to figure out why. And you could see in the photos of their trees that the canopy of their trees were very dense. And this is very typical with in-ground figs. They put out a lot of bushy growth and they're not very good at self-thinning themselves. You kind of have to come in here and actually do the thinning and staking yourself. Or even if you're really good at pruning, you can maybe solve it yourself that way. But you need to be really careful about what branch gets how much light. Because every branch, if you want that branch to fruit on the tree, you have to give it a specific level of intensity of light and a duration of light. And it's a combination of those two things. I, don't, I can't quantify that for you guys. Uh, every variety is actually extremely different. So that's why people always just say the general recommendation is let's give the tree or give your fig tree as much light as possible. So in the process of me doing that, um, I've learned quite a few things because when you chop the trees back to six to 12 inches, or if they get killed by the winter as anyone in a colder zone seven, a zone six, a zone five, a zone four, we're all gonna really struggle with keeping our fig trees alive in the winter time. I'm right here on the edge you know, five degrees is really right on the edge of some even very hardy varieties surviving the winter. Um, you really have to be in a really warm zone seven or a, a colder zone eight to have the majority of your fig trees, excuse me, survive the winter. 
So when they die like that, or if we prune them really hard, it doesn't matter, it's really the same effect. The trees then respond the following season by growing very vigorously, right? It's the same kind of thing of like if we did summer pruning versus winter pruning, right? Winter pruning when the trees are dormant encourages the trees to grow and typically it's very healthy, vigorous growth that doesn't have a lot of fruit on it. If you do the summer pruning on a lot of our fruit trees, well that in the case of like an apple tree may help the, the wood in the summer actually set the spurs for next year. And it's the same thing with pretty much all the fruiting trees that you can think of in a temperate place. This summer pruning really helps flower development and fruit development the following year. Whereas the opposite is true with the winter pruning. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's a problem because when the trees then re-sprout from the base, um, they are very finicky. I've used in the past. That's the word I've used in the past. Now I would say that they almost revert to like a juvenile state, almost like an infancy state. Here's actually a tree right here that got killed by the winter. You can see that. Some of it survived all the way down there at the base, but look how many suckers it's now sending up. And a lot of times it sends up so many suckers, maybe even 20 to 30 suckers, and that's just too many. Because how can you have 20 to 30 shoots in a very small area? They're just not gonna get enough light and they're not gonna set their fruit buds. I also kind of, if you wanna think about it in a different way, I also kind of like to think about these new shoots that come up as almost like a water shoot. And you know, you guys know what water shoots are. They're extremely vigorous shoots on your fruit trees. I actually just did my summer pruning. But you may have these shoots that come up, like this shoot back here was quite vigorous and I had to prune it back in the summer just to stop that growth and maybe even encourage it next year to actually fruit. But these water shoots typically, like I said, they tend to be very vigorous, they don't fruit. And only until you slow down that growth will they actually put out their fruit. So that's a big problem with growing figs in a colder place. Um, if we're going to, or even spacing the trees at a high density, because if they're at a high density, they're very close together. Like I said, they're two foot on center. I have a tree right here, a tree right here, and a tree right there. So in order to keep those trees you know, fruiting in the given amount of light that we have here on this property, in this location, right? Every variety, every branch needs a specific amount of light to set those fruits. So we have to keep things contained. We can't let one tree get massive and shade out the others. We can't let one tree kind of grow into the other one. Everything needs its very own methodical spacing for this to even work, for anything to really fruit in this spacing. And you know, it just, it just, like I said, it just creates these issues. But if we were to then prune in this spacing, or if the winter were to come in here and kill our trees, well, then we would have a lot more of a difficult time, as I said, because the, the branches revert to a state of infancy. They become these water shoots. And I find that the more pruning, actually, that we do, the worse it gets, the more difficult it is for these branches to fruit. It's not like it's impossible that if the winter killed our fig trees and then they re-sprout from the base, it's not impossible that they won't fruit that season because it happens actually, and I figured out ways to really make that happen here on the property just by giving them enough light that they need, thinning out the number of shoots here from the base, and that way they actually get the spacing that they need to produce the fruit buds but it's just not ideal. And that's what the conventional wisdom is. That's the why behind the conventional wisdom is if you're gonna grow figs in a colder place and you're gonna plant them in the ground, you should protect them. And the reason for that is because if we take winter damage on our fig trees, we are then losing out and making it more difficult, I should say, making it more difficult for our fig trees to fruit the following season. What also happens is that depending on the buds actually that are present on the tree, they tell a different story. And I wanna show you guys very quickly because we looked at one end of the spectrum, right? 
we looked at the, shoot, the trees that got chopped down to the base. They send up the water shoots. The other end of the spectrum is this tree here, this little ruby that survives the winter with no damage. I didn't even protect it actually. And it is growing from the buds from last year's growth. And that's the best case scenario, right? But there's a lot of growth and a lot of buds in between that are at varying difficulties of getting them to fruit, right? Um, so if the water shoots are the most difficult to fruit, the easiest to fruit actually are the buds, the growth that comes from the buds of the apical bud. And what is the apical bud? The apical bud is just very simply the highest growth point on the tree. So if you can preserve these growth points next year, right? This is where the leaves come out of. If you preserve enough of these growth points, you're gonna have the easiest time getting your fig tree to fruit the following season. So the growth that comes out of here, these growth tips, these apical buds, here's actually one right down here. And you can see, I didn't make any kind of cut. This is just a continuation, basically, of the apical bud into this new branch. And there is fruit on this branch. We are now very beginning of June. This is when I would expect to see fruit. And because the apical buds are so vigorous, they have so much energy, they fruit the easiest. They have the easiest time producing fruit at an earlier date. The next buds that have the second easiest time are the lateral buds. So here's the apical bud, right? This is the continuation that we talked about. Right next to that, right below it, is an apical bud. And this apical bud, typically you'll see on the branches last year, are quite protruding. So something like this as an example, you can look there at that brown wood. There's a bud right there. It's not necessarily that protruding, right? It's kind of just, I know my camera doesn't want to focus on the thing I want it to focus on. But you can typically see at the end of the season that the, the branches that are protruding and have the most energy are the branches or the buds, excuse me, that are swelling and to swelling to some degree, like they're larger. And those are gonna be the buds that typically have the easiest time to fruit the following season. So they typically have a bit more energy. So that's number two, right? And then there's all these branches kind of in between because the little ruby tree, believe it or not, some of the tree actually did take damage. And this branch right here, as an example, took damage. This branch down here took damage. Um, this branch up here took damage. But the majority, and this branch actually over here did as well. But the majority of the tree did not. And so it's amazing to actually compare the buds and the, the fruiting branches that took damage to the apical and lateral buds that didn't take damage. And the difference is clear. It's a huge difference in terms of how easy it is to get it to fruit and also how early the fruits are. So this means that if our trees survive the winter, we wrap the trees, we're gonna have the best success. Here's actually over here, this branch took some damage and you can see, look how much smaller and weaker this branch appears to be and there are no fruits present just yet. Same thing down here. This one even here, this branch looks even a bit diseased. This appears to be a lateral bud and there are small fruit buds present there. This is also a small lateral bud here and there are the beginnings of fruit buds. Here's another branch that took place and look at the difference. Just look at the difference in these buds compared to something like this. I mean, that's quite the difference. And some people may say, all right, well, Ross, what about fig mosaic virus? But the truth is this is not just on one particular tree. This is across all the trees. And I've noted this for many years now. So that's my point is that uh, if we want to get earlier fruits, we want to have a more successful crop we want to have an easier time fruiting our fig trees. And really, no matter where you live, you don't want to be pruning your fig trees all that much or having them get killed by the winter colds. 
So uh, for us in colder places, obviously we want to protect them. For us in warmer places, to guarantee ourselves a crop, maybe we don't have a ton of light, maybe you guys are in the, are in the Pacific Northwest, you don't really want to be pruning your figs all that much. And I think, to be honest with you, the pruning should be very limited. And if you're going to be pruning at all, you should maybe even consider just removing the apical buds. And the other alternative is to remove some of the lateral buds that are protruding and have lots of energy. If you take too many of those lateral buds away, your tree will res respond the following season and love to grow and grow and grow and kind of revert back a little bit to that juvenile infancy stage and uh, will not fruit at an earlier date than otherwise. Of course, you can hard prune your tree. You can even cut it back way to the base, to six to 12 inches like I've done, and the trees will fruit. And in specific climates like Southern California, maybe Arizona, West Texas, you know, these are places that you could get away with doing something like that. And that's an easy way to kind of keep your fig tree small and contained every single year. But there is some, a little bit of expertise in there because you need to be able to thin out those branches. You need to be able to give all those new branches enough light. Now, here I can't afford to do that nearly as much. I would love to just have this situation every single time. The trees survive the winter time. I don't have to cut them back to six to 12 inches, but then I have to wrap every single tree. And if I were to wrap, you know, 130 fig trees, I would lose my mind. So one of the alternative, alternatives was that I originally came up with was, well, we're gonna cut them all back to six to 12 inches, and then we're gonna cover them. And that's called the cut and cover method. Well, guys, I have another solution that I think is just bringing this whole thing together all of the things I just mentioned to have the best scenario actually possible. And I think it's gonna be really brilliant um, because I'm already seeing results here. We've already done it to some extent. And I also think um, if I can figure out exactly how I wanna do this next year, we'll have a really good uh, idea of comparing the production on something like this little ruby to then again comparing the production in a really high dense uh, spacing. So and that was my original thought was well not only do I have all these varieties I want to trial them I want to plant them in the ground you know I want to have enough cuttings I want to have established trees um, but I also want to see if the difference between this larger tree here that you see that's been in the ground for a number of years, if for some way that I could actually outproduce this tree in the given space that it's in with spacing them actually two to three foot on center. And here's the answer, I think. Here's the solution. I highly recommend that you guys do this. Anyone can do this. Because when you plant a fig tree in the ground, something happens very often the trees send up a lot of suckers and it does depend on the variety but you could go to the base of every single fig tree I have in the ground that is somewhat established and you will see many 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 suckers from the base from lower down in the soil maybe from a bud actually above the soil but something that's much lower down and this past winter I had two suckers actually because I didn't protect anything on the property this winter. I did not try to get my fig trees through the winter. We did that winter, we did that hardiness experiment that we talked about a week ago, um, or actually a few days ago. And we said in that video that uh, I actually had these LSU Huye suckers survive the winter. And they survived the winter so much that they even produced down there a Brava. So these two branches were on the tree and by the way, here's the LSU Huye branch. This was the single stem whip that I really wanted to protect. I wanted to protect this on purpose and bend this over and cover it. That was the whole plan. Just like with this JH Adriatic was to bend this whole thing over to, towards the ground and cover it. Same thing with this stallion and this, a bunch of these branches that live, the LSU Tiger and the Safari and the Nerino, um, the LDA, the you know, Azores Dark back there. But I ended up not doing that. And what was amazing 
is that this LSU Huye survived. I mentioned that and said, wow, that was pretty impressive because these were both suckers that are only, you can measure this at the top here. Here's the top of the growth last year. They're only like a foot and a half off the ground. So about 18 inches high, somehow these suckers survived. And it's weird because typically the, the suckers from the base, they grow and grow and grow and they grow so quickly that I said that they're healthy, they don't fruit, but they also don't lignify up in time. And because they don't lignify, they don't survive the winter that, that easily. Something happened with these particular suckers. Maybe I had pinched them a few times and kept them from growing and that helped them lignify. I'm not sure, but looking at these suckers actually, I see a lot of fruit. I see a ton of fruit. And this is such an amazing realization because not only is it on these suckers here, but it's on other varieties too, like this Ronde Bordeaux. We, we did protect this. Um, I did throw a couple tarps over this tree. This is the only tree that I did protect. And you can see, look, here's a sucker down here and there's a branch from the sucker. And guess what's on the branch? Fruits, the double dots. It's all over these, these suckers down here. Um, here's another sucker. Look at that. There are actual visible figs on this branch. Um, again, from down here, here's the sucker and a continuation. Here's the lateral bud and here's the apical bud. On this LSU Huye, these suckers over here, we have actually one, two, three, four, five, six, almost seven, but I have six fruiting branches here that have formed on this sucker. And it's almost like a mini tree in itself. And here's another one right here. This one has, I think, about four or five fruiting branches on that one. Yep. And all of these branches on these suckers have fruit. And by the way, all of these suckers, these were not even given a head start. Nothing over here was given a head start whatsoever. There was no low tunnels, no plastic. This Ronde Bordeaux, the same thing. These are gonna fruit at the same exact time as this Little Ruby. And Little Ruby for me last year fruited August 1st. It produced a number of Breba. But isn't that amazing? That all we have to do is give the tree some sort of structure to get that through the winter time so that the branches don't revert back to some weird juvenile infancy stage. They don't become water shoots. And if we can protect all the buds on those suckers, we don't have to protect this massive tree. We don't have to branch up, get all the branches and tie them all up and then cover them with a tarp. All I have to do is bend over this extremely pliable, small sucker that's only 18 inches in length, bend it over to the ground, cover it with mulch. I don't even need to put a tarp on it probably. It's so pliable and easy to hold that thing down to the ground. All I could do is just cover them with mulch and then in the spring, plop it right back up and I get all this fruit set. And I can do that in such a small area that I don't even, uh, I truly believe that that will be able to compete in terms of the amount of fruits in this same spacing. If this was a six by six area, the amount of fruits that would come from those suckers would compete with the same thing here in a six by six area. Um, or even let's say a tree that let's say it grew taller, but it was six feet wide and six feet across. I do believe the, the production would be uh, much larger actually in this higher dense spacing. So we're gonna find out next year. I thought this was an amazing tool to share with you guys because this is what I'm gonna be doing is that all these branches are gonna come up from the base as they normally do in the form of suckers, right? Really vigorous water shoots. I, I thin them out to about four shoots per tree give them the light that they need. I stake the branches away from each other so that they're getting the maximum amount of light that they, they can receive. And then of course, at the end of the year, I'll chop them all down like I normally do for cuttings. And then I will leave in the fall behind and in the wintertime behind a few suckers. 
and then those suckers will get bent over to the base. Every single tree suckers, by the way, without fail, here in this climate. And those will be bent over, again, as I said, staked to the ground, covered with mulch. We plop them back up in the spring, and they produce really high quality fruit at a very early date, uh, at the earliest date possible. Of course, very similar to if we are protecting them. Uh, and to me, that just seems like an easier way to do it. Wouldn't you rather just bend over those small, pliable branches to the ground, cover them with a little bit of wood chips and walk away? You know, it, it just seems to me um, like a very easy solution. The trick, I think, and the, the little bit of planning that has gonna have to come in here is at the end of the season, sometime in September, I'm gonna have to evaluate the suckers in all the trees. And as I say to myself, all right, well, I'll select a number of suckers, I'll pinch off the tops, help them lignify, stop them from growing, and then those will be the suckers for the following season. And kind of pay attention to which ones I'm keeping and which ones I'm not. I typically actually tend to air layer the suckers. Um, so this year I will pay a bit more attention and, um, and not. So yeah, that's just really awesome in my opinion. And actually when I was going through and thinning these, these branches down here, I probably should have been a bit more careful. I usually select the most vigorous, healthy branches, but those are the water shoots. Maybe if I wanted to in the future, change it up a little bit, I could even try to, uh, you know, select branches that are from a, some kind of a base like this. Here's another actual sucker that survived. This is LSU Tiger. But this right here, you can see right next to that, just super fat, vigorous growth. This one probably won't have the fruit set that I'm looking for until later in the season. And, and then at, at that point, basically it's too late, but this sucker here, the growth from this sucker should fruit at an earlier date like we mentioned. Same thing down here. Yeah, this LSU tiger over here has got fruit buds on it. So pretty darn amazing stuff, I, I think. Um, I think I finally figured this one out with, with what I just said. Hope you guys understood all that. I know it was a long explanation, but this is a really awesome revelation for me. And um, you never would have picked this stuff up, you know, I think People, you know, are so quick to write off that something won't work or something will work. And they're not open-minded enough to trying something else, trying something different. And maybe I'm a little too open-minded sometimes. But, um, yeah, I do think, guys, that uh, there's a huge value in this. Just trying anything different. You know, over the years of growing figs, I've you know, tried every little thing I could, right? Just go back to all the crazy videos I've done on these figs. And some things worked and some things didn't. But at the end of the day, I never regretted really any of it because I learned, this was all learning experience. And then I take this information that I get here and when I buy my new property, I do it for real. I made all the mistakes. And when I make all the mistakes here, it doesn't matter. This is the place where I can make all the mistakes. Uh, and it's really the same thing for you guys. You really should have a healthy attitude towards mistakes. That's only how we learn as growers. Killing our plants, you know, is a great example. Getting a green thumb. Well, why did you kill your plant? When you figure out why you killed your plant, then you don't repeat the same mistake. But making that mistake only helped you learn and realize what the mistake was. And making the mistake, of course, right? That's how we become better growers. We observe, we realize why we did this the wrong way, and then we don't repeat it again. Anyway, guys, thank you so much here for watching this one. We'll talk to you soon, all right? Take care, hit that subscribe button. Catch you guys for the next video.